Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We partner with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies, train the leaders to build power from within their constituency. And in 2022, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, take action and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com. Dot au. Today's podcast is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Who knew that using a different coloured pen could make your will invalid or that removing some staples means the document is no longer legally recognised? Morris Blackburn's expert lawyers know all the important tips and making or, and, and make creating a will easy. I always stuff that bit up. Uh, simply complete the online form and they'll arrange a time to discuss your needs and prepare your will and store it at no extra cost. Search Morris Blackburn Wills on the Google box today and get started on your affordable lawyer written will. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast out every Friday that dives into the progressive campaign issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And on this week's episode, we are joined by the co-chair of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, uh, Marcus Stewart, is on the show to talk about, or give us an update actually on um, how treaty negotiations are going and obviously we're leading into uh, a contentious date in the Australian calendar, which is Invasion Day on the 26th of January. Uh, and we'll have a chat to Marcus about kind of Australian shared identity with our First Nations peoples and a whole bunch of other really cool things as well. So uh, check out today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser and Spotify. Uh, Spotify is adding a five-star review system to their app at the uh, now. It's up now. So be sure to give us five stars it, uh, when you're done listening to today's episode. Just give us lots of stars and give us wonderful reviews. Uh, for updates, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. Okay, let's get to today's episode. <laughs> Okay, we are taping this one on a Tuesday in uh, Melbourne in, on Wurundjeri land. And uh, I'm joined by the co-chair of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, Marcus Stewart. Welcome back to Socially Democratic. No, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Uh, I haven't spoke to you since, uh, well, certainly on the show anyway, since March uh, 2021. Um, and it's great to have you back on the show again as we sort of get ready for a, a new year. Um, and obviously there's a um, bunch of things going on with the Assembly and I just wanted to check in with you and see how you're going. But one thing I did want to do actually in today's show is we've got a whole bunch of new listeners and I, there's a whole bunch of people, not necessarily um, outside of Victoria, but probably in the state of Victoria as well, that are unaware of the historic work of what is going on in this state in terms of negotiating a treaty between the Victorian state government and the First Peoples. You are the co-chair along with Arnie, Jer- Arnie Jerry um, of the very first democratically elected Aboriginal People's Assembly. And, uh, and I just wanted for you to just talk us through a bit about the work of what the First People's Assembly of Victoria is doing, its primary purpose and, you know, who it seeks to, uh, to represent. No, absolutely. It's always, um, always a good time over the holiday season to stop, reflect and think about, um, you know, what's happened. We recently celebrated our two years into our elected term and so... Um, you know, nation leading work, um, you know, got the eyes of the nation and eyes of the world watching us at the moment, negotiating a, a framework for a treaty. But we're a representative democracy, a democratically elected body made up of um, 31 traditional owners from across uh, Victoria, all elected and all entrusted to, to lead our community on the journey towards treaty. Uh, we've got a responsibility to set up the, the process and the architecture of what we'll see treaty making for the first time in this nation's history. So um, back in, I think it was September to November 2019, which feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I think we remember sort of the the horrific bushfires in Jan 2020 and then something small like an international pandemic, which has sort of thrown thrown everything out. But um, we went to the polls, our community went to the polls and elected the inaugural First People's Assembly of Victoria. And I was lucky enough to be elected to the uh, male co-chair role, along with my fellow co-chair, Annie Geraldine Atkinson. Um, 
But yeah, ultimately our task is to deliver against four things which are articulated in the advancing the treaty process with Aboriginal Victorians 2018, which I'm happy to dive into. But um, yeah, first of its kind, first, uh, I guess, representative democracy negotiating, you know, the treaty architecture and process in the state of Victoria. I'll ask you about those four, um, the four elements that make up the framework to negotiate the treaty in a moment. But actually, it's just an interesting point there because you're right. You'd, the Assembly was elected um, uh, two years ago, but the majority of that time, you've physically not been able to meet face to face. How has that experience been? Can if you think about the expectations that you possibly had about going into this journey and having a First Peoples Assembly, this historic um, black parliament, uh, but then all of a sudden to then not be able to actually see each other face to face. How have you, how, how have you and your fellow assembly uh, members dealt with this, this uh, challenge of, um, of um, being isolated through COVID? I mean, that's a great question. I think uh, we've experienced every emotion under, under the sun. Um, we're all excited once we're elected, our inaugural meeting coming off a high and then um, uh, the mood switched and the um, the whole world sort of sort of changed to an extent. We um, we were lucky in a sense that because we're a statewide body and we run a lot of committee meetings to, you know, focus on the key work, we're already using, you know, digital platforms to, to hold meetings such as Zoom. Um, so we kind of already had that, then behaviours set. So for us, it was about pivoting quickly. I mean, changing all your plans, pivoting quickly to doing everything um, electronic and, and digitally. But I think it's, in, I think one important thing is, you know, we understood like the dramatic impacts of the bushfires, which, you know, um, we often don't think about given we're mid or hopefully towards the end of, a, of this pandemic. But that was horrific through, you know, the northeast and the southeast, and you know, the traditional owners throughout that country. Um, and then, obviously, uh, the pandemic played a big part on that. What what it actually offered us was, and what it offers our community, is an ability to look past the devastation of that, then bushfires, the devastation of um, of COVID and the impact that's had just on society more broadly and think about what does five, 10, 20 years look like? What's the aspiration? What's our ability to dream around how do we create peace and an equal footing within the state of Victoria between what we negotiate and what the state of Victoria negotiate um, with us? So treaty offered us an ability to dream about what does life look like with treaties in place? How do we improve the lives of Aboriginal people? How do we, I mean, we're all aware of the statistics. Um, they're supposed to define us as Aboriginal people. And so I think as tough as it was pivoting, we couldn't meet face to face. It was hard on our, our old people, our elders. Um, but it gave us a unique opportunity to stop, reflect and start having the conversations online around what does life look like with treaties? We all know what's going on. We're experiencing it on a daily basis, you know, with the lockdowns and whatnot. Let's start dreaming about what the next 5, 10, 20, 25 years look like. So um, as tough as it was, it provided us a, uni a unique opportunity and it kind of galvanised us and helped bring us together. And so we've made a lot of progress in just two years. We've still got two years to run in our elected terms, so halfway point. Hmm. But, um, you know, upon reflecting of where we've, where we've come over two years, I think it's pretty pretty amazing and astonishing of where we've got to. And it's an absolute credit to the leadership of um, of my fellow members, but just an absolute credit to our community who are the architects, who are, you know, the designers of this process. The, whatever we deliver will be in their aspiration. Talk us through the four elements that make up the framework in negotiating a treaty with the Victorian State Government. What are those four uh, key elements? Yeah, sure. So... The first thing we had to agree on was an interim dispute resolution process. So we've never seen a legal instrument such as that used in negotiations between a state government uh, or a federal government for that matter and a traditional owner group or a traditional owner representative body. That was important. While it doesn't sound, uh, you know, um, it doesn't sound as amazing and it just sounds like a, um, a legal instrument, interim dispute resolution process. 
I described the publicly as a great equaliser because it was our ability to set the tone and set the landscape of how both parties come together and how we're going to negotiate the substantive matters through treaty. And going an extra step, we pushed government to award us procedural rights, never been done in any negotiation. Procedural rights to sit as equals at the negotiation table, which government agreed to. So something that wasn't made public, something that there was no chest beating about, but a significant um, concession in good faith by the Victorian government to actually look at ways to bring us together as equals. Now, that'll get collapsed into one of the substantive um, pieces that we're currently negotiating, which is the Treaty Authority. So we're working kind of tirelessly at the moment to try and reach agreement on what a Treaty Authority will be. Best way to describe it, it's an independent umpire. It'll be responsible for how negotiations between traditional owners or, tra or negotiations around a statewide treaty will be conducted, bring parties together, make sure they're, you know, happening in good faith um, and that, you know, it can reach a, um, a fair outcome from, from both sides. Then we, oh, sorry. I was going to say, why is that important that you have a, an independent umpire um, in, in, the, in the work of seeking out a tree between the Aboriginal community and government? I think if we look back to, you know, experiences, there's been some significant commitments made around this country you know, whether it's national land rights, treaties, um, big commitments, the Uluru Statement from the heart, but there's never been a checks and balances process or an entity that can hold those negotiations accountable and make sure they occur. And I think that's a significant part around what the architecture or the institutions will look like for treaty is there is, there is a treaty authority that need, from our perspective, has to be has to hold cultural authority, has to be independent and has to be Aboriginal-led um, because we've seen breakdowns of negotiations. Government typically use the tactics of funding um, or lack of funding or stretching out timeframes. Uh, I think as, as traditional owners, as Aboriginal people in Victoria, our lives are inherently political and legal. And we often get the, you know, the raw end or the wrong end of the stick when it comes to negotiations with government. Now we've got an entity that will play an umpiring role to make sure that we can reach agreement in good faith where both parties are happy. And that's significant. I mean, the name of it doesn't sound as significant as what this role will play. It's going to be huge. Are you going to negotiate treaties at a statewide level or will there also be local treaties? And if there are, how do they, I mean, how do you avoid, like, um, what am I trying to say? Which takes precedent? How do you make sure that there aren't ones that, if you get multiple treaties happening at multiple times, how do you ensure that you're not stepping on different traditional owners' toes or getting, yeah. getting that balance right? That seems quite complicated to me. One of the key roles that I'm sure the uh, treaty authority will have to, uh, <laughs> have to manage, such as it's, um, is um, the importance of its role. But um, what we've heard loud and clear in our consultations around the treaty negotiation framework, and what we've been lucky enough to do is to reach every corner of Victoria and speak to our mob, hold the conversations, and continually build on that engagement. But one thing was clear is it has to it has to be a hybrid. We want to look at a statewide treaty, but we want to look at traditional owner treaties based on their country, um, within their aspiration, how they want to govern. Um, and a statewide treaty has to look at the institutional power. How do you put traditional owners in the driver's seat? We've heard, and you know, there's been media reports on, is it a black parliament? You know, is it a tribal council that holds this this political power for First Nations people to make decisions on First Nations issues, issues that impact us, us having, you know, ability to make decisions on that, whether it's lawmaking and whatnot. And the other question that keeps coming up is, and if we think about that shape, it's very similar to the Sami parliament. Um, then there's the question around seats in parliament which I'm sure, you know, might be of interest to um, to your listeners, um, no doubt. Seats in Parliament, we see it in New Zealand. 
our community have been very strong on this one. So there's two options there, or do we look at both? Do we look at, you know, a black parliament as being described within our community and reserve seats in parliament um, to represent, you know, First Nations people? So the framework needs to basically set out what's going to be negotiated through a statewide treaty and whatnot. And that's one of our substantive matters. matters. Everything sort of hooks into the treaty negotiation framework. And then we're tasked with the responsibility of negotiating a, um, a self-determination fund. So our opportunity to have an independent revenue or source of income that funds the treaty architecture, keeps political commitments, election commitments, bureaucracies out of our lives, so we see treaty making in the state of Victoria as part of our furniture, just what we know as the norm in Victoria, that we have traditional owners negotiating treaties or settled treaties on their land, on their country. How does that self-determination fund work? Is that something that you would negotiate uh, through the course of the treaty and it would be a fund that would be set up that would have would, would would be there just for that moment to settle those treaties, or is it something that would be a fund that you would foresee that would be continually resourced over you know a long substantial period of time? Some of the key questions we're asking our community right now: What does it need to do? What's its scope? What does it look like? Um, is it just to fund the architecture of treaty? Does it have a broader scope than that? Will it play a, a settlement part of, um, of treaties? Who knows? One thing that we've heard as well, loud and clear, that you can't settle treaties without settling reparations. So does the fund play a critical role in reparations? That's, that's I guess, the evolution and journey we're going on now through our conversations with community because this is a grassroots movement. It's a bottom-up approach. While we're elected representatives to represent our communities or our constituents who have um, elected us to sit in the seats, whether it be democratically elected or reserved seats, um, the the architects and the ones who are going to drive this process are our community out there. Um, it's going to be delivered in there by their design, their aspiration, uh, and in the shape that they want it to be. So. That's the uniqueness of what we're negotiating here. Everything is informed and driven by our mob. It's interesting you say the word reparations because as you were talking about it, I was thinking that in my mind. I've got a couple of colleagues in the United States that are doing a lot of work in the African-American community around reparations. And, you know, it's such a vexed uh, topic even from within the African-American community to, to work out what does that look like. Um, there's, a, there's, there's not a lot of clarity about practically how would that work. Um, I'm just wondering about that. What kind of conversations are you having within the Aboriginal community about that? Is there, I mean, is that something that has come up already? Is that something that's certainly on your mind as a leader within the community? Um, and I'm also then wondering how uh, how a non-Aboriginal government would respond to what I would call the R word, you know what I mean? Because I think a lot of governments kind of freak out about, oh, shit, how much is this going to cost? Um, yeah. Just talk us through the, the, what's going on inside the community about um, discuss, discussions around reparations. Yeah, absolutely. Always the key question for governments, what's it going to cost? Um, and our question always is, what's it going to cost to do nothing? Mm. You know, um, Victorians and Australians more broadly are quick to forget that we pay taxes too as Aboriginal people. You know, we're part of this society. Um, hence why the York Justice Commission is so critical. It's our opportunity to turn the invisible visible the oldest living culture in the world is right here, present in Victoria. And we have an opportunity for the York Justice Commission to gather the evidence, to understand, you know, whether it's we're traditional owners of country or whether we're non-Indigenous people living on Aboriginal land, we all have a story and a sense of connection and belonging to what this great land is. Um, so it's... It's a unique opportunity that Europe provides us. It'll gather the evidence, treaty will provide the reform. It plays an important role in reparations because I'm sure from what we're hearing in our consultations, we're gonna hear from our community coming forward and speaking to the commissioners and putting forward what they see as, you know, what needs to be key reparations. We saw last year in March, the government's commitment, the state government's commitment to a stolen generation redress scheme. Fantastic, it was one of the last uh, governments to do so, which is amazing. 
we now have the challenge, um, and I've saved the best part till last because I don't have a clear answer for you, the challenge of unpacking what reparations needs to look like and what, what it has to do. Because if we think about 233 years of colonisation, we've seen slavery here, we've seen forced removal of Aboriginal children and families, we've seen dispossession of land, we've seen massacres. What's happened in Victoria in particular has been horrific, but what's happened around this country is, is horrific. So we need to think about, you know, it's quite an emotional conversation when you're talking about reparations because the trauma, the experience that our community carry, whether it be vicariously that we shoulder or whether it's happened and been passed down through generations, uh, through intergenerational trauma, we need to think about what does a reparation look like? What does it look like in our context? Um, and bring that to the negotiation table. But there's kind of a a few things that need to happen before we have any clear, um, I guess, well, clear idea of what that needs to look like. And that's, again, our community being the architects of that. The other um, point you mentioned, I want to pick your brain on as well, is the actual representation that you want to seek out of the negotiations of treaty, um, it, be it, as you said, a, a black parliament um, or seats in the existing Victorian state parliament that are solely uh, set up for Aboriginal Victorians, um, or both. Uh, talk us through the thinking, and I, I know that I, I understand right now you're still trying to work all that through, but um, the or both I find interesting. I love the idea of a black parliament. I think that is fantastic, and I'm really proud of what you guys have achieved thus far by creating the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. I think it's just amazing. Um, the or both is interesting. Talk us through the, the, the thinking of why or both. Yeah, it's, um, I, I was just thinking back as you were saying that and reflecting back to, um, you know, what we're kind of working through as a, as a community and as a representative body. And it, it reminded me of um, back in February 2016 when we held a community meeting and called for a treaty and the state government had gone, all right, let's do it. And we're like, okay, shit, what do we do? Um then we held our first meeting at, um, at in the upper house and what was clear to the Premier is we want a stolen generation redress scheme, building on the activism and advocacy of our, you know, our ancestors, elders um, and community. State government was like, let's do it. Um, then um, we're like, oh, okay, great. Um, Truth telling, June 2020, called on, um, you know, basically a truth-telling process to support a journey towards treaty because without treaty, without truth, you can't have treaty. Again, the state government, all right, let's do it. Then we're like, okay, we're, this isn't too bad. Three from three, let's actually push our luck here and say, okay, we want to hold the pen. We want to co-author the terms of reference and build a mandate or a you know, TOR or letters painted as it's now formed to make sure that whatever this inquiry or Royal Commission looks like meets our community aspiration. You know what the answer from government <laughs> was. Um, so, um, which makes us nervous now because we're looking, and, and I just wanted to set the context on this because now we're looking at what the aspiration of representation looks like through a black parliament, if that's what our community want, through reserved seats. What we know is we can't have, you know, if we think about the federal parliament, we can't have white lawmakers making decisions on Aboriginal issues. It just doesn't work. Any government will tell you that they need to do better in improving the lives of Aboriginal people. The, the data says it all. That's where we need traditional owners in the driver's seat. And, you know, whether, it's a, whether it be a, it's called a black parliament or reserve seats, it gives us an ability to make decisions on the key policy and legislation that directly impact Aboriginal people. So that's the opportunity here. So we need to talk with our mob, our community to understand what does representation look like? What's the aspiration, you know, from a technical point of view, what's the membership, what's the structure, what's the powers, uh, and how does that sort of all come together? That's what we've got to go out and understand and unpack, which we're currently doing. Um, and we know we've got a government, a significantly progressive government with a massive appetite. So there's real opportunity here 
But more so than the appetite of the government is the appetite of Victorians who want to make a difference, want to do something different and better because they know the outcomes. No one wants to be paralysed by the outcomes. And so that's why through the treaty, through the truth journey, we've said through truth stand with us. It's a responsibility that we all need to shoulder. It's going to be hard to hear some of the things we do, but we hear um, when our people come forward, tell their truth, um, tell their stories, but walk with us on the journey towards treaty because that's what's going to redefine, I guess, the cultural tapestry of what the state of Victoria is. Listening to your answer there, it made me actually think about, I mean, if you look at the way that the parliaments are set up in in, um, in Britain, uh, there's obviously a there's a Welsh Assembly, there's a Scottish Parliament, um, but there's also Westminster. Um, there is that balance in which there are Scottish MPs that are sitting in Westminster making decisions about Scottish affairs, but they've also got their own parliament as well. And there's no reason why you can't do both. I actually know there's an argument going right now that English MPs are telling what, what, what the Scottish MPs to piss off altogether. But um, hopefully we don't get that in terms of the context here. We're talking about um, having both a black parliament and reserve seats for Aboriginal uh, Victorians. But it clearly can work in which uh, you can have both a voice in the state parliament but also have your own reserved parliament to deal with your own uh, affairs. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that plays out and what the community sort of sort of settle on as you get closer into negotiations. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it's been described as, um, you know, federally as a voice or constitutionally enshrined voice. Um, but... I think we'll see significantly a dramatic change in outcomes when we see traditional owners in the driver's seat and true representation of that. So we've got a unique opportunity here. Um, and, you know, as I said, our whatever we deliver has to match our community's aspiration and um, they've made it loud and clear what they want. How does uh, Treaty go from being... Because, I mean, you know, just you and I talking about it right now, it is... It can be a very processy type conversation, can't it? Um, and we should always look at you know the framework of politics through the eyes of um, meaningful benefits for a community. Um, and when I think about the meaningful benefits for the Aboriginal community, what what does that look like? What does treaty do to advance the livelihoods of Aboriginal Victorians? That's a good question, and I think the simplest way how I think about it in my mind is how do we change or how do we turn treaty from rhetoric to reality? Because now we're going to deliver something. And what that is, is we're going to improve the lives of Aboriginal people. Um, we know, you know, if we think about Victorian data, for example, um, Aboriginal Victorians uh, would die 10 years younger than our fellow Victorian. Highest child protection rates of Aboriginal children in the state of Victoria. Uh, over incarceration rates, um, you know, um, key topic of discussion has been raised the age. Aboriginal children between 10 and 14 are nine times more likely to be incarcerated or put in detention. Um, you know, the data goes on and on, and this is data that's supposed to define us as Aboriginal people growing up. And um, I think the critical thing for, and as I spoke about earlier, the critical component of where truth fits is that's a process of, you know, gathering the evidence, but understanding in particular that the systems and structures that have been set up here, how and why they disproportionately impact Aboriginal people in particular. Treaty then has to be the vehicle to for us to reimagine what those systems and structures look like to deliver the reforms. So we can then achieve the outcomes that are needed and necessary and that's having us in the driver's seat. But right now we've seen consecutive government after government after government, all meaning well, you know, through different initiatives, different, uh, you know, programmatic responses, you know, dis, dis, I mean, different systematic responses, um, trying to chip away at this without success. But there's always one common theme that, you know, the governments continually, you know, do when they try and improve the outcomes for Aboriginal people. And it's always, you know, white lawmaking makers making decisions on behalf of Aboriginal people. So we need to empower Aboriginal voices, Aboriginal people to be front and centre on the issues that impact their lives in particular. And that's the opportunity we have through treaty. 
And give us an update of where you're up to at the moment, because I understand that um, you know you'll you'll have elections for the assembly in um, March 2023 or there or thereabouts. Um, you're going out and doing a lot of consultation with the community at the moment. That would have been certainly challenging through COVID because you physically couldn't see people face to face and had to do a lot of it online. Um, how is the work of engaging with the community going at this point in time? Um, and what are what are some of the key learnings that you're taking from this this engagement experience? Yeah, that's no, a that's a good question. Um, so we've got up to November 2023 to have our election. So we've just kind of ticked a little over two years. Um, right now, where we're at is um, is a critical part of the consultation. Uh, we've just had our engagement um, our engagement team trained up, um, you know, on how we how we go about our field work and whatnot. Apparently, they um, they had a really good trainer and really good person running the trainer and helping them out. So. And offered some new perspectives on how we go about that now. So, you know, what is what is their role as engagement officers, as community members? How do they organise? So how do they now start building that relationships and networks and treaty champions? So we're building a movement here. Um, and there's a real opportunity that we're on the verge of history here. How do we start working and building and gathering momentum uh, as the you know the key pieces such as the authority, the fund, and the framework start taking shape because we're at the negotiation table now, uh, negotiating what the authority potentially could look like, also the framework, and so our our ground game is critical to to how we bring everyone along. We've got elected responsibility to engage with our community or constituents, whatever whatever you you know you want to describe it as, but. Um, What's critical is our is our field and our ground game uh, on how we bring people along on this journey because there will come a point in time where the next um, First People's Assembly of Victoria, when that's elected, they'll negotiate a statewide treaty. And so this is a movement. We're gathering momentum. We've built a significant amount of momentum um, from where we started. And, you know, the show goes on. So we're at a unique point in time where we hope to soon land uh, some level of agreement around the authority with government, no pressure on their end. Um, and, you know, we're progressing conversations around the framework. So you talk, uh, exciting times. You talk, talk a bit about that, 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 that ground game. And I noticed that um, your, the, one of the focuses of the, uh, the, the engagement officers is to get Aboriginal Victorians to enrol to vote in the assembly elections. Why is it critically important for Aboriginal people to have a say in who is elected into the assembly? I mean, there's numerous reasons to be brutally honest, but um, if you want to, if you want to truly be represented in, you know, in any democracy, uh, you need to vote. You need to roll out the vote. There's no good um, throwing rocks from the outside if you don't actually exercise your vote to support a person you want to see who you think best reflects your voice, um, whether as a representative um, or whether you want to run yourself. So what we're saying to our community right now is if you think you're the best person to negotiate a statewide treaty, enrol, vote, nominate and run, and because we need our best players at the table and that's the beauty of democracy. Um, we're not all going to be satisfied with um, who gets voted in, but as long as we take control of electing and voting and supporting the people who we think truly represents our voice, that's the best thing we can do. I think one of the um, remarkable things about what you actually are doing right now as well is you're, uh, you, you know, we, t we as uh, Democrats take for granted the fact that we have a voting role and, you know, when you turn 18, you, go, you basically go on the roll. What you guys are trying to do is actually trying to build a role from scratch. The AEC didn't actually just hand you a document and said, here's the 30 or 40,000 Aboriginal Victorians that live in the state of Victoria, off you go. You actually have to go out there, find them and enrol them to vote, which is a challenge in itself. But you've slowly been methodically working away at, at doing that. It's, it's, a, you know, it's such an important piece of work, but, um, um, but would be difficult as well at the same time. It's... Um I mean, it's not easy, and it's a credit to the work the team have done. I mean, our, what our community wanted was independence. They didn't want to use VEC data or the VEC role or the AEC role. They wanted to build it from scratch, and that takes work, and that's hard uh, because 
you don't vote in our process, you don't get fined like a state or, or federal. It's not compulsory to vote. It's voluntary. Um, and, you know, you see not big turnouts in um, in voluntary voting process. Just look at the US election when Trump got elected. I think he um, got a little over, or obviously got over 50% of the vote, but I think there was a 34% almost turnout of all Americans in the vote. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't significantly high. Um, and we're in the same position. We're trying to, you know, get our mob to to enrol to vote, um, get to the polls, vote for your representative who you think truly represents your voice or best represents your voice, um, because that's your way of controlling the outcome. This is our community's process. It's not ours as elected members. We've got a four-year term to deliver on what we're elected and entrusted to do. And then we go back to the polls to elect the next um, First People's Assembly of Victoria. So it's critical if people want to take control of um, the process, they need to activate their voice. And it all starts with enrolling and voting. We are coming up to uh, Australia Day, Invasion Day for many people. Um, and with that is the annual debate about uh, the change the date and what Australia Day represents. Um, for First Nations peoples and the need to change it. I want to get your sense on uh, what your thoughts are about Australia Day. And I, I certainly have read some things you've said in the past about some creative ideas about how we can um, best create a day that um, celebrates Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal peoples. No, it um, comes around every year. And I think um, this year my patience are just that little bit less and less. I think... Um, I'm kind of, when I think about it, I'm kind of tired of the bullshit rhetoric that, you know, let's exclude our First Nations people rather than look at a date when we can all celebrate. It's kind of, it's becoming a bit childish from my perspective. And how it's getting embraced by our, the federal government is kind of, you know, I'm not angry anymore. I'm kind of embarrassed of how, you know, childish and kind of juvenile it is around embracing this this division where we've got an amazing country here and it'll be this country will come together and we can find a date where we all can truly unite and feel that we can all celebrate of what is i believe the greatest country in the world um i'm sure others would probably dispute that but when jan 26 come, comes around it's probably the only day each year that I'm actually not proud to call myself an Australian, to call myself a First Nations Australian. And um, I hope we see, or I hope at one point in time, hopefully in the near future, that, um, you know, my son knows Jan 26 as just, you know, well, one being Invasion Day, but we have another date to celebrate that we um, we all feel that we've got a sense of connection to and, and we belong to. And it's not um, this divisive politic that people have become so casual and so comfortable just to perpetuate. So um, I guess my patience has run a little bit more thin each year on this issue. But, um, yeah, I just love the opportunity to, to celebrate a day that we all, you know, are proud to be part of this great country. I saw a, a, an ad um, for NITV uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago and it made me really think, it was talking about the sort of the stories of, the shared stories of 60,000 years of history on this continent um, and I, as a student of narrative uh, public narrative and the story of the story of us uh, it made me reevaluate or look at the, the, the concept of a shared story um, from a new perspective which I think it's probably useful for a lot of us. Maybe a lot of Australians do look at it this way, but it was certainly it made me sort of sit up and think, yeah, you're right. Because I, I sometimes think that from a from a from a non-Aboriginal or a colonial perspective, um, our we think about our story beginning upon when we arrived here, and then we're sort of saying to Aboriginal people, oh, you know, and you can be a part of that story too. Um, what this ad was saying was that the story actually began sixty thousand years ago, um, and we are all a part of this one long journey that started 60,000 years ago. And that is the story of us. Uh, and I hadn't, 
I know that sounds really st- stupid or probably simplistic, but I had never thought about it that way because I mm. always felt like oh, it would be rude of me to say, can I be a part of your story? As in, you know, a son of Scottish migrants, that arrived, a family that arrived in Australia in the 1950s. Um, I felt I would feel um, that it would be, can I get permission to be a part of, you know, Aboriginals, Victorians' story that began 60,000 years ago. But the ad was kind of saying, Yes, we're giving you permission. You should be a part of this. Um, and I thought it was beautiful. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on... Um, because I think that the problem with Australia Day is it sort of says that the story begins on the 26th of January 1788. That's when the story starts. And we, yeah. we get taught that in school. But really we should be... All, Non-Aboriginal Australians, should, whether you arrived on the first fleet or whether you arrived on an aeroplane, you know, six years ago or whatever... We should be being taught that the the story of this continent began, and there's a land that we all live on began sixty thousand years ago. And I just don't think that that sort of ceased, seems to certainly didn't sort of permeate this noggin of mine. Um, and I just thought that was interesting. I just want to get your thoughts on that. So that, that shared experience, that shared story between Aboriginals and non-Aboriginal Australians. Well, it's a part of our story, isn't it? Um... You know, and it's that whole, you know, if Australia start, or, you know, what was it, 1788 is when the narrative starts and where people think that that's all that matters. I mean, people are entitled to their opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Mm. Um, I think, um, I mean, it's a really interesting concept, and it's I often talk about, you know, whether you're traditional owners of country or whether you live on Aboriginal land, it's something we all can feel connected to and belong to, This the oldest living culture in the world, but... We've got a country that lacks an identity. And we've got a real opportunity here to, you know, to embrace the narrative. It's not rewrite it, but embrace the narrative. What is the true history of this country? Um, Noel Pearson kind of sums it up best. And, uh, you know, I apologise in, adva- in advance if I plagiarise sort of his, his commentary. But uh, he talks about 60,000 years of history. Settlement the building of the institutions uh, upon European settlement. And then post-75, immigration. So, you know, gone is the white Australia policy, um, but multiculturalism Australia post-75. But right now, I guess the best way to describe it is you've got these three pieces and this lack of identity, this overarching umbrella identity. And on each side of um you know the the european settlement in the middle are these magnets that just don't connect Mm. because people are not open-minded enough to understand that we have an amazing story here whether it be the sixty thousand years of history and first nations history and we're still here that's something we all should celebrate which all should learn about but also the amazing nature of multicultural australia of what that's brought and how that's enhanced and enriched our society We've got a truly unique identity here that we can embrace, but yet this whole denialism um, and casual denial of what we truly are as a nation is is what's holding us back. It's it's like a time capsule that's happened, basically. Like if you look at the Australian flag, it is it's just emblematic of of that middle piece that you're talking about. Because I think if I was from a non non British background. You look at the Australian flag and think, well, that doesn't represent me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you're First Nations, you look at that and go, well, that doesn't represent me. Um, you know, and I know it's only just symbolism, but it, ha- it has to go beyond that. But it just does look like that, doesn't it? And I think the Liberal Party are very much ha- hanging on to <laughs> the values that that period represents so tightly because they, they, they've obviously got some fear if that goes, then, then their identity's gone and they're, they're, you know, they're kind of lost in this crazy world of multiculturalism and. Well, I, don't know, I don't know what's going on in their mindset, but it's something that um, we really need to get a, get a handle on. And, I, you know, education plays such an important role in that. I was talking to a Kiwi friend of mine uh, last week and she was talking about, um, uh, was it, um, is it Waikato, the, the, the work that they did from the 70s onwards that instituted into the curriculum, the mainstream curriculum of primary schools and secondary schools of the teaching of Maori culture to young Kiwis, whether you're, um, you know, brown, black, or white, 
um, that that was embedded into their curriculum and it's just completely refocused people's understandings of their first peoples. Um, I, I never got that at school. You know, I think we did like sort of Aboriginal history for, you know, three weeks in year seven that was it. And this is in 1988, so it's showing my age. Um, this, you know, I just... And I'm jealous. And when I go to New Zealand, you can see the knowledge that all Kiwis have. And it's not a perfect world. And she said herself, we need to do so much better. But it's a start. And we just lack that here in Australia. And I just wondered, like, is that something that out of treaty that we can focus on br- bringing those, those shared stories together through our education programs as well? Absolutely. I mean, that's... Um truth-telling will play a critical role in that and how we teach First Nations history in schools um, could be part of what, you know, treaty delivers. Um, I, remember, I remember getting kicked out of a classroom at school because I argued with the teacher around Captain Cook. I argued that they were a lieutenant when they arrived and they argued different. So, but apparently, you know, it didn't really matter from my end, but he wasn't a captain when he arrived. Um, and, I mean, yeah, it's just... There's a real opportunity to teach our future generation and our kids what, you know, the history of this nation is. But that's made up of a lot of different parts. It's, one, it's not, you know, we're not saying exclusively you can only do one thing or another. What we're saying is that we can enrich a state and a nation by teaching them the true and the oldest living culture and about that culture in the world um, through primary school, through high school, that it's not just an opt-in elective process. Um, that just reeks of white privilege. Um, and that whole notion, you know, that when people challenge white privilege, well, the difference is, is they don't have to teach their kids about racism growing up um, at a young age. Uh, and if we're talking about teaching kids, that's the difference. That's why we need to teach people about the oldest living culture in the world, 60,000 years plus of Aboriginal history and Aboriginal culture but also how that can bring us together, not, you know, tear us apart. Um, language is the other one I'm interested in. I, think, I don't know if we talked about this when you were, when you were on the show last time, um, but uh, uh, the, I noticed that the Moreland City Council are going to change their name and there's a real push for sort of co-naming of places, the ABC, whether uh, they're renaming all of the, 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 the cities. Um, in the traditional names of the Aboriginal peoples of those areas, which I think is fantastic. Um, the role of language is such a strong uh, um, form of identity. And as someone who is, um, speaks terrible Irish, and it's a language that was taken from from my ancestors by the, by the English, um, and it's only spoken by about 5% of the Irish population now, but it's such an important piece of identity. And I just, um, I, I, I just wonder the role of language, because it does play an important role in the Māori culture. And if you go into New Zealand, a lot of the government buildings are in English and in Māori. Um, talk us through the, the importance of language, because um, it seems to be going through a bit of rejuvenation within, within First Nations uh, uh, peoples, um, certainly here in Victoria, and I want to get a sense of what, what can be done in that area as well to sort of build on both your own identity but also that shared experience that we can all have? Recognition is critical and language is a key component about that and or a key component of that. Um, we talk about education in schools. Language is critical. Um, you see, I remember, I think it was the Mornington Peninsula where they suggested renaming of certain locations and there was a big outcry not realising there's a lot of Aboriginal names around, um, you know, Melbourne and Victoria already. Uh, there's a local council um, or an LGA, Murrindindi Council, which is a Tunnerung, um, a Tunnerung word. Um, so it's already present, but it's recognition's critical. Visibility is important because then we truly know and can embrace what we are, and that is the oldest living culture in the world and it's something we should celebrate uh it's often just goes jump straight to the negative and the divisive angles or you know cultural wars but this is something we all can embrace and we all should be proud of uh, as i said earlier whether we're traditional owners of country or uh, non-indigenous people living on aboriginal land but language is significant recognition is critical even though you know it can be symbolic but it does represent something long sustaining and something that's been here for generations upon generations and that's important um 
You've uh, got a big year ahead. Just uh, what are, what's the primary focus of the First People's Assembly in the coming months as we sort of move into 2022 before we wrap up? Treaty Authority. Um, we're currently in negotiations with the Treaty Authority and uh, out there yarning with um, with our community members and got a discussion paper live at the moment asking some key questions on, around what the aspiration and what the shape of that needs to look like. Um, we're obviously in negotiations around the treaty negotiation framework, which is critical, and um, and also the funds. So from a sort of step back point of view, the key pieces of treaty architecture, we're getting really close to hopefully reaching agreement and landing what will be the architecture that sees through the treaty process to its next uh, evolution. So we'll see for the first time in this nation's history treaty making in the state of Victoria and again Victoria leading the way. It's huge. Marcus, we wish you the best of luck uh, for 2022 and uh, the work that you and uh, the Assembly are doing is um, as I said before it's it's historic and it's critically important and um, um, I will, we'll, uh, we'd like to have you back on the show to give us an update on how things progress as you make some um, big decisions going forward. Thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Cheers. Hey there, thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.